Good, good things. There should be a panel. Hi, about Andrew. That. Nice to meet you. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Siegel Center. My name is Peter Eckersall, and um, on behalf of Frank Henschke and the center, I'd very much like to welcome you tonight to this evening uh, discussion around uh, the theme of urban dramaturgy. Um, I'm a professor uh, in the theatre program here at the Graduate Centre and I work on various aspects of both Japanese theatre and dramaturgy. So um, my interest in dramaturgy is very particular to this session tonight. Um, I'd like to welcome all the dramaturgs in the audience tonight too because uh, um, we're, we're out there in the world. <laughs> um, I'm going to chair the session, introduce the panel and then I'm going to turn it over and each of the panellists is going to speak briefly about an aspect of either their research or their artistic practice as it relates to urban dramaturgy. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to ask you to turn off your or silence your mobile phones, please. Um, and just to say that the centre that we're in, the Siegel Centre, is uh, a public programs unit at the Graduate Centre aligned to the theatre program. And uh, it has a very important role in being a bridge between uh, the academic work and research work and teaching work that we do in the program and uh, connecting with the artistic community and the broader population of New York. And we run many programs in this center over, over the year, uh, some of which you've seen on the screen and they're all our spring programs in the booklet that you got with your hand out there. Um, so thank you for coming. Urban dramaturgy, two very interesting words. Um, I think we all probably have a sense of what urban is, but uh, it's interesting to think a little bit about how this term has come into a certain kind of um, uh, attention in the 20th century and very much in the 21st century. We live in one of the great urban complex places in the world. Um, and this idea of urban, I think, is increasingly or has been a fascination for artists uh, for many, many years. But the idea of taking artworks into the urban environment is something I think that has grown in popularity in recent time. Of course, there are many previous examples of people doing this kind of work, uh, but I think uh, in recent times we've had a lot of, uh, I think, critical and artistic attention on the idea of what happens when you do an artwork that engages with a public in an urban space. And so one way of thinking about a dramaturgy, an urban dramaturgy, is to think about the kind of uh, critical thinking that artists engage with when they think about a project that might work in a public space or in some kind of urban space, some kind of interaction with not only uh, a, a perhaps an invited audience who might come and participate in, in a show, but also uh, the other public who happen to be in the space at the time and are interacting with that work, um, but also the urban infrastructure and how artists are using in very creative ways the infrastructure of the city as it exists, various pathways through the city, um, perhaps uh, thinking about the way in which a city functions as a kind of cultural infrastructure. It has certain kind of lines that run through it that might be associated with demographics, they might be associated with certain networks of power, certain classes, certain ethnicities, um, and so on and so forth. And so I think some of those, there's some of the questions that we're going to look at tonight in this uh, panel with this very distinguished group of uh, uh, people who are now very, I'm going to briefly introduce and uh, truncate their resumes in, uh, for, the, for, for time's sake, but uh, full resumes are in the program that you all have. So first we're going to hear from um, Bertie Ferdman, who's actually put this uh, event together tonight. So she's the kind of chief dramaturg tonight. So. Um, thank you for doing that. And Bertie is uh, a colleague of, of, of ours in the, in the, the larger network of um, the uh, City University of New, New York. Um, uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Speech, Communication and Theatre Arts at the City University of New York BMCC campus. And uh, she's also a graduate of this program, uh, taking her PhD from this program, and she's published extensively on the question of urban dramaturgy. In fact, she's probably one of the current, I think, really interesting provocative theorists who are opening up this topic for us uh, for discussion. Um, 
Then we'll hear from Jeff Stark, who um, I'm really pleased to meet you, Jeff. I've known of your work for a while, and um, it's a pleasure to actually see somebody whose work you've seen from the distance and uh, come face to face with the person. Uh, Jeff's site responsive work emphasizes the significance and spectacle of collective experience. And he has many projects ranging from secret dinners to full scale narrative productions that make sometimes unauthorized use of public and private spaces. And his events have been covered by many organizations, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, National Public Radio, and also some uh, national and international media, including um, NHK, which I was interested to see, the Japanese national broadcaster. Um, third speaking will be Mallory Cutlett, who's an, an Obie award-winning director and dramaturg of performance across a range of uh, disciplines from city council meeting and experiment in participatory dramaturgy with Aaron Landsman and Jim Finlay uh, that the audience performs to Dred Scott's performance installation, Dred Scott Decision in BAM's Next Wave Festival. And there are many other credits there that I invite you to look at uh, uh, tonight. And then finally, uh, we'll hear from Andrew Kirscher, who's an associate producer with the Devised Theatre Initiative under the Radar Festival at the Public Theatre. And he's also a PhD candidate uh, in the Graduate Centre, currently working on the question of uh, uh, copyright and new media performance. And um, I've got the pleasure of working with Andrew on that, on that project. And it's going to be a really, I think, interesting, uh, very cutting edge uh, kind of research that you're doing there. Um, so it's a very diverse panel. I think really interesting perspectives to speak from. And then I'll follow up a little bit at the end with attempt some kind of, uh, I, I don't think I'll be able to summarize the key perspectives adequately, but I'll attempt to make some uh, comments and then we'll open it up for questions and have at the end always the, the famous Siegel Center pretzels and wine, which are, <laughs> um, you know, must go down in culinary history as the most remarkable uh, <laughs> um, dramaturgical event. Um, so first speaker, uh, is uh, Bertie Ferdman, so over to you, thank you. So thanks for coming and thanks for being here, especially the panelists. Um, <clears throat> I put this event together basically because there's a forthcoming issue of PAJ, the Journal of Performance and Art. Um, of a, there's a special section that I curated that's called Urban Dramaturgies, and um, in it I have a, a feature there that talks a little bit about some of the issues we're going to talk about, not all. So I I'm obviously have a big interest in this, and so um, I wanted to kind of put this together to, to have a, more of a conversation with, with you, and you can share your work, I can talk about what, 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 what questions we have. Um, but before delving into what is urban dramaturgy, I just wanted to start with a little story about uh, The Angel Project. So um, it's a story about me experiencing The Angel Project. For those of you who don't know what The Angel Project is, it was, there's like a horrible echo, but you guys are okay with the echo. Um, so The Angel Project was a show directed by Deborah Warner. It, uh, it was commissioned by the Lincoln Center Festival. Some of you are nodding, but it was like this massive production where you, where you went around one by one. They, they build it as a site-specific uh, art installation that you experience by yourself. You have to be silent throughout, and you were kind of paraded around different sites in New York. And in between, you got to kind of see the city. And so um, I didn't have a ticket for the production. It was $90. And um, it was the last day. Uh, if it's a long story. In fact, I was involved in this other really bad urban project, so I couldn't go. But anyway, um, I, I, the, this is just to give you an idea of the places you visited. And so I, my friend was like, you should just use my old ticket. They'll never know. And it was the last day. I was like, OK, fine. Um, so this is kind of a, a, an idea of what, what, what I saw, what you would see. You, you went through it in a private apartment. And, and then site five was here. And this is actually what, um, this is 42nd Street before they demolished it in 2006 to make the Bank of the America building. In fact, Pushama. Pushama. Uh, oh, yeah, that Pushama. was Piparama. <laughs> and this, this was um, owned by the Durst Foundation and therefore leased to Chashama. So it was a performance space, and they're recognizing it because it probably did shows there. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone so, did shows um, there. <clears throat> so so everybody's good with Angel Park. Okay, so I'm at going to site five, and site five 
the way she had it was it was a mirror for, so from the outside. So because you saw a mirror, like you're walking the sidewalk, and people would stop and see each other, see themselves. But then when you went inside, it like it was a theater. Like you were sitting, and it was framed. So you're like, oh, look at that person, like framing New York. And so then, and then then like there was like stuff inside in a basement, all these books from the story of the angel and stuff that you could follow. So on my way out, so I sat there. It was hot. I saw the people. I went out to go to site six, and there, like literally, and I'm not even kidding you, where the umbrella person is, I, and then at the time I was pregnant, like really big, somebody comes and like stops me there, and she's like, I'm really sorry, whispers in my I'm really sorry, but you're going to have to leave. Uh, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. First she said, where's your ticket? So I was like, oh, God, I, I know, I know. And they had told me that this might happen, invisible people ushering the show who you didn't know. And I was like, I'm sorry, look, I'm writing about, I'll just be honest, I'm a grad student, I'm pregnant, like, you know, I, 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 I I really want to see the show, and I write about this. And she, she was a nusher, probably working for free in journey. Anyway, and, and, and so she's like, uh, no, listen, um, I would let you stay, but you have to leave. And, and then, and that's where, and she's like, and by now, we're, you're part of the show, because we're, she didn't say, no, no, no I'm, I'm going above. I'm going beyond. She's like, you're, we're all being watched. My manager's in there. I'm, you're not going to be able to go to site six. So I was like, OK. So meanwhile, I became part of the very show that I wasn't allowed to attend right there and then at the, in front of the Piperama. And I left. And I mean, I say that story because even though the content of Angel Project was the beautiful, and I love the piece. You know, I'm not, I don't have an issue with it. You know, all this beautiful uh, story of the angel and the spiritual art installation, the, the, what it became for me was something very different about access, about, uh, pr you know, Paying a lot of money, I don't think that the that what the spectators at that moment had in mind was that they were paying a lot of money for a private experience in a public space or in public spaces to see the city and homeless people. But um, regardless, uh, you know, I, it, it's it's why I became interested in this. It's what I think about all the time. So it's kind of framing the frame of how I look at um, urban dramaturgy. So what is urban dramaturgy? Now, uh, another little story, before I even tell you what Urban is, is that I became obsessed with this artist who's still around called J.R., but like before he won the TED Prize, you know? <laughs> um, because my husband is a photographer, and so we kind of knew his, of his work before, and I, and, um, I always, anyway, this is, oh god, I'm getting on a side note, but I, I kept, I always am like, why don't you tell more photographers to put their photos out in the city? But anyway, so JR was doing this, and I became obsessed with his work, and this is an example of, uh, he calls all his, the earlier work, 28 millimeters, this is part of Women Are Heroes. Um, it's called 28 millimeters because he used a 28 millimeter camera to, to really um, get so much detail and, and be able to um, enlarge it so big. Um, and then he would paste these uh, illegally, uh, and eventually they would vanish with time. So they're kind of like vanishing mise-en-scenes of the city. It's another way of storytelling. And usually it would be uh, and mostly of the people that were living there. Okay, This is just one example. He did this one in many, it, this piece, Women Are Heroes, in many places, including Brazil and other places. And this is just an image of Quibra. But moving on to this one. Now, this is a very interesting photo um, because this is his. This is one of his earlier pieces that he did in 2004 with Lajli, uh, who is a filmmaker that he was friends with in Clichy, which is a very poor area outside of Paris. And one year after he did this project, the riots began. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but they, there were riots in Clichy in 2005. And um, what happened is that when they were filming, the cameras became there to film the cars burning and everything. That picture still remained. So that what you had was like the burning and then like him. And what Leslie is doing there is putting a, you know, a video camera uh, like a gun. And then that's what was being filmed. And almost like saying, um, and I wrote this because I didn't want to say it wrong. Um, you know, who, who, who's menacing who? Um, uh, be careful, he seems to be implying. I'm also recording you. What is more menacing, my image of you or your image of me? And, and of course, there's a, a, a layering of images because most people are looking at it through the eyes of the TV. 
Okay, so um, I only say these two stories because there is a re clearly a relationship between content and context that's going on all the time, regardless of whether the artist had that intention. Um, and we'll come back to that, that later, uh, that whole idea about content and context, and even if the artist didn't have it in mind, because you're in the city, things happen, right? So how, you already want to play between fiction and reality, and then the reality takes over. It's kind of like that Brechtian thing where that there was a mistake and that person coming to get it is much more interesting than that story over there. So, um, okay, so the urban, I, I uh, and this also has to, I think you'll make the connection, but um, I, I was very influenced by the work of David Harvey who teaches here and I uh, did a fellowship with him in, called Radical Urbanism and he has a manifesto um, following the work of, of Lefebvre called Right to the City. It's a, it's a beautiful one and this is a quote um, from him that I kind of inspires me to think about what is the urban. The question of what kind of city we want cannot be divorced from that of what kind of social ties, relationship to nature, lifestyles, technologies, and aesthetic values we desire. So in other words, uh, what narrative of, so, so urban is not just a spatial term. Uh, it has to do with what I'm saying, context and everything. It's a claim in the city and all these artists saying, we're gonna make it poetic, we're gonna, they're claiming that space too. It's not just a physical space. Um, and that implies human rights. And so what narrative of the urban is being performed? What city is either desired or produced through these vanishing mise-en-scenes is always a question that I'm asking myself. I don't know the answer. Um, although you can argue that dramaturgically for each piece. What communities, regardless of geographical specificity, are present or silenced? Okay, just because they're not there doesn't mean they're not there. Okay, and... Um, and so dramaturgy, uh, I'm, I'm clearly not talking about a linear kind of dramaturgy. I'm more interested in meaning making and, con and how do you contextualize meaning making. Uh, and this is from the work of Kathy Turner and Sin Brett, I cannot say her last name, um, have a book out called Dramaturgy and Performance, where, where Peter is often um, quoted, I should say, um, but this is how I'm thinking about dramaturgy. It's a complex dramaturgy, moves beyond the identification of one single overarching narrative or story, and instead implies multiple readings of the possible association of seemingly disparate threads. And I think you can make a connection here between what was happening in the Angel Project for me when I was kicked out of it, even though it was the sidewalk, and, um, uh, and JR's, um, uh, and uh, JR's um, piece that was then kind of remediated and remediated. Um, okay, and so then, uh, because of time, and we, you know, we want to be able to discuss all these things, uh, uh, like I said before, in this section, in the, in the article that I wrote, I kind of, um, give a, a brief overview of many of the artists working today and how they're using the urban. And um, so just to give you an idea of some of the artists that are, especially specifically to New York, okay? Uh, so there's been a big scene. The clicker is not working anymore. Oh, there we go. Okay, so, um, so some of these, okay, uh, do think about access and, and public and private, and so they've decided to completely make go permitless uh, and, and, and specifically reclaim that public space. Okay, this isn't something new. This has been happening for a while, but these are just some of the things that have happened around New York recently. And I, I should say, though, however, that, that there has been a shift uh, specifically when I think about you know, the big productions that Encarte Arts used to do in the 80s, and they used to really produce that show, or even Meredith Monk um, was commissioned by people like Dancing in the Streets, and now it, um, space has become much more complicated in New York, especially after 9-11. Um, I think maybe you can speak to this and how <laughs> um, uh, groups have decided to kind of claim that space. But this is a, a project called Lost Horizon Night Market that lasted three years uh, by Mark 
uh, and Kevin, and I cannot pronounce their last names, that basically asked people to, that was not marketed because it was technically illegal, so you don't want, you don't want to market that, um, but, but, but participatory and, 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 and celebratory, if you want to call it that, uh, where pe artists were invited to kind of curate a truck and it became each a theater. So the whole street uh, kind of became this, whatever you want to call it, regalia of um, a neighborhood. This is Ida Benedetto and Andy Austin. I think now they changed their name to Sex. Sextant um, Works. Thank you. What? Sex Sextant, Sextant Works. Sextant Works uh, atop the Woolworth Building, also using spaces uh, that are sometimes at the brink of development, but in this case, but the, but um, all the time uh, illegally. Okay, so the, it's very careful. The whole operation has to be really well well thought through in order to to, to make it even doable. Um, this is Sarah McMillan's snow migration, which took uh, participants uh, to Staten. Is she? Yeah, she's there. Staten Island, um, and. <laughs> Yeah, oops, no, and then, oh, so this one I put here, this is on your programs because I, I, it's, I think it's important to, to note that this isn't just like only artists doing this illegally or like, you know, in some far off corner. I mean, now this is very, this is highly institutionalized and there, uh, and this is live art, live um, Times Square Alliance. So budgets is not, there's different budgets involved here. Um, but they have also wanted to reclaim the Times Square Alliance space, and they've produced a lot of uh, things, including uh, this was um, Nature Theater of Oklahoma's Midnight. This is, they're doing a lot of midnight moments. This is midnight, even though it looks like it's daytime. Mm -hmm. And then Elastic City, who have been around for a while doing alternative kinds of walkings, um, different kinds of walking tours. Am I at 10 minutes? Okay. Time's up. <laughs> okay, okay. I do have one more. Okay, so we'll, we'll skip these. Too bad, too bad, too bad, too bad. <laughs> but I, cause I, okay. Um, and then I, I, I just wanna make sure I, I talk about this one for a second. It's a good way to, to kind of frame this whole thing. Um, one of the things I do in the article forthcoming in the May issue is, um, <laughs> I can't believe it, is um, I talk about pieces that I, I consider landmark performance. One of the things that fascinates me, why I love this work, is that uh, artists, unlike me, are really visionary and they like can transform a, a space. That's why, that's the whole thing about going to a dilapidated, abandoned place, because they can't they can really transform it. We talk about being transformational in art, and it's very abstract, but I feel like sometimes people really transform the space. And so I, look at, I looked at certain performances that happened at a moment in time where that neighborhood was literally at the moment of transition. So you can kind of think of those performances as, as a kind of poetical or historical look in New York about on, on really gentrification, if you want to call it that. I mean, they really marked, so you can, if, for example, um, Reza Abdo's um, uh, father, um, thank you, uh, ha really marked me packing district quite at a moment in transition. And then this is the hill, and I want to make sure um, we, we name because Gabriel and Nick are here, and, and I, can, we can come back to this. They, they stage Heiner Mueller's Medea Material, uh, and that's not the, it's a very long title, which you probably, Argonauts, uh, at the hill. The hill is the last shanty town. Uh, in New York, and it was demolished in 1993. It's at the foot of the Manhattan Bridge. They built a teepee here, uh, which I, I can't go into all the details. This is it. At, for, they lived there for three years, and then they staged this. So there was like a, a double dramaturgy in, and, um, uh, in, involved here, uh, which I think is important to read. The first was, huh, one more minute. The first was the theatrical staging of the play itself for a limited audience of 15, and the second was the comprehensive piece, the TP itself, which housed the play and you guys from November 1990 through May 1993. This, and I quote uh, Nick, this three-year-old enactment and paratheatrical performance of the Mueller piece had a much larger impact with more than 78,000 vehicles and 350,000 people crossing the Manhattan Ridge every day gazing at the living history of the TP in this shanty town. Um, I, I did just want to point out the, that those portraits that are reminiscent in a way of JR's work, hand painted by Gabrielle, 
I just thought it was like a nice ending. Uh, you can see them there. So the kind of you know mediatized, globalized world we're living in now. But that's, I think I'll end there. Thank you and very much. Sorry, yeah, I went over. Superb. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks. It's okay. I'll, I'll give away my time to you. Okay. <laughs> um, and we'll have time for questions at the end, so we can come back and, and look at any images or ask further information about that. So. Next, we'll hear from Jeff, so thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm gonna stand up, actually, Absolutely. probably over here at the podium. I will also pitch for this. Um, I have read this uh, article, and it's great, and the reason why it's so great is because it takes all this stuff and makes sense out of it in a way that we all sort of have various touchstones, uh, and this kind of lays them all out in a timeline, and, it, and, and kind of suggests a lot of strange bed bedfellows and shows a lot of influences. I, I totally appreciate it, I didn't know all of them, but I knew several of them. Um, I'll try to not spill on your computer. Um, so I agree with almost uh, everything that Bertie says, except for one thing, um, which is that this is uh, a reaction to a post 9-11 world that we live in. Um, for, for me, uh, came here in the late 90s, um, my reaction was a reaction to that the end of that Giuliani era, that era where he was moving through town, cleaning things up, throwing out teepees, um, basically making uh, public space a, an incredibly contentious space throughout the city. And uh, you know, for me, making art and making culture uh, is a way of, of living, and it's specifically a way of living in the city. So when you have someone who is constantly pushing people out and constantly uh, making, uh, putting artists on the run, putting people on the run, putting populations on the run, you end up with this kind of um, uh, uh, widely contested space. And so moving here, uh, I was able to walk right into uh, events like Reclaim the Streets, um, who were working from an idea that came from London, um, and it came from London via uh, the theorist Hakeem Bey, who's kind of a crazy person, um, but made a really great uh, point about temporary autonomous zones. The point with temporary autonomous zones is that capital is everywhere, it's omnipresent. The only way to stand up against capital is to have a brief moment in time and disappear into the city. So this was the reclaim the streets idea. And this is the idea that a lot of theater makers were using at that point, and I think continue to follow today. So I am going to talk about a very brief moment in time um, called The Dreary Coast, which was a, a show that um, I and uh, some friends put on um, last October uh, on the Gowanus Canal. I live a block and a half from the Gowanus Canal. That's where I've been for the last 15 years. I've been making work here. Um, I find that the canal is one of these weird places in the city because of its in incredible pollution, its foulness, its disgustingness. It is a forgotten space. It's a, a, um, a space that's contested, um, like those streets of the Giuliani era. Um, it's a place that people don't know what to do with yet. Um, there's a suggestion that it will be cleaned up. Whenever you see the... Um, the pictures of all the condos uh, that are proposed for the era. There's always a, a nice uh, white couple in their um, kayaks, just you know, cruising through the water. Right now, this uh, canal is literally full of turds, uh, actual turds, poop, uh, floating through the canal. Um, that means no one's watching it. Cops have no interest in it. Uh, it is a forgotten space, and so we put on a play on the Gowanus Canal. And the way that this play worked was that you showed up um, at a, a bar, actually above a bar, and you uh, had a, co a costume put on you, and you became a shade uh, in the world of, in the in the underworld, and you joined Karen, this um, figure here in the middle, uh, on a sort of guided trip uh, down uh, down the canal and uh, through the River Styx or the Acheron. Um, we told sort of two stories uh, interwoven. There was a sort of Orpheus and Eurydice story and a sort of Persephone uh, myth as well at the same time. I assume that you guys are all familiar with those. So as we, sorry, as we moved through the canal, uh, we kind of came across all of these beautiful spaces that are uh, more or less unseen because you are at points that don't have street access. And you end up with, or we 
ended up with um, a place where sort of architecture and the city and the sort of spaces actually kind of start to provide a lot of the um, uh, emotional moments for our show itself. So, you know, during the bleak romantic breakup, you would kind of come around a corner and you would have this horrible urban vista out ahead of you. You guys can all imagine this. So um, I like to work with spaces like this, and I don't think of them, I don't think of these works as site-specific works as much as I think of them as site-responsive works. Um, site-responsive is um, yeah, an idea uh, that I came across um, uh, actually not from performance works, um, but specifically from the artist Robert Irwin's work, um, who was trying to figure out a classification for sculpture in public space. And he came out with you know, these ideas that there were uh, you know, kind of plop art sculptures, which is basically like a, a, a man on a horse um, in marble, and then tried to figure out ways to talk about works that were actually um, conditioned by the space that they were in, the kind of works that he was interested in. So he called them site conditioned. I came up with site responsive for, for the way that I wanted to refer to them. It turns out lots of other people like that as well. Um, this is the border line um, at the end of the canal um, and sort of the moment of will, will they or will they not look back? It does not go well. Um, uh, another artist um, I was obsessed with um, getting into this work, not just um, the the not just uh, the the work of the late '90s, but um, Gordon Mata Clark, who I also felt like was an artist who was deeply interested in how to be in the city. And so he would make these works and then invite people to come and experience them. That kind of became a, a, a touchstone for my work. Another one. Uh, gosh, we're hitting these weird doubles. Um, I think we already went over it, but uh, Reza's, uh, Reza Abdo's work, um, father was a pe peculiar man, I can't say that word, uh, deeply influential to me. Um, some work, a work that I never saw. I've seen every single piece that he's done um, on video at the library, totally not the same thing. Um, but I found uh, his work uh, by seeing the work of Gail Gates and, and, and seeing the works that referenced um, Raises work. Also, Robert Wilson's Ka Mountain. Um, most of you know a three day ordeal in Iran. And Robert Irwin's breakdowns. Um, but so all these people become reference points, but the real sort of influences of all this work is this sort of community that um, Bertie identifies in this great article. Uh, Julia Solis from Dark Passage. Sarah McMillan's uh, Snow Migration, a collaborator on the Drury Coast as well. This is a sticky thing. Duke Riley's, um, sorry, Duke Riley's work, uh, The Dead Horse Inn, which is a, a, a bar that kind of shows up underneath a overpass for one night at a time. And there are things like bare knuckle boxing and five cent booze. <laughs> uh, and um, Nathan's uh, The Night Heron, um, also Sextant Works The Night Heron, um, inside the water tower in Manhattan. Mm. Uh, and then um, leading me to the water and sort of the showing me the, the lawlessness of waterways in New York City was Swoon and the Swimming Cities at Switchback Sea. So I think that I'm actually kind of coming up um, on time, so I will actually, maybe I'll just say that for me, all of this work, um, actually the, the sort of, uh, the, the drama that actually doing shows, doing full length plays, started um, for me with uh, basically putting on dinner parties in these spaces, um, in these abandoned spaces, and trying to bring people into places where they really weren't supposed to be and watching the, the sort of heightened awareness that you get from an audience in these spaces. And from the very very beginning, um, this is a, a secret dinner that was in the grain terminal in Red Hook. Um, one more. Um, that's a terrible photograph. Uh, from, the, from the very beginning, I was interested in trying to figure out ways to actually perform these spaces, um, to let the performers 
use them and bring the audience to see them in different ways. So this actually you can see is two lines going into a tunnel, or not a tunnel, a, a, a cylinder. If we go back, okay, you'll see. The top of the grain terminal is a room full of holes in the floor where all the grain would go in. Hmm. And the bottom floor is where all the grain would come out. And there's actually nothing in between. There's just 12 stories of silo. And so what we did was for this performance, or one of the, the performances that night was we lowered a, um, a singer uh, down those lines and had him sort of sing an aria as he was lowered. And so you heard this beautiful echo kind of mm. coming up. And watching the reactions of the audiences and, and the, the excitement of the performer led me to say, OK, well, there's really something to these sights and something to the spectacle. For me, I wanted to go a step further and start creating the narrative. So the rest of my slides are all about narratives. I'm going to stop, though. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, I sent photos to this person via email, and I'm way. hoping, sorry, I'm hoping they're, what do I? Ah, okay. Oh. So, um, all right. So, I'll I'll try to be. I'm going to speak specifically. Although that picture of Shishama, the first <laughs> actually site-specific piece that I made in New York, is Shishama gave me a basement in one of those buildings that was rough, and I developed this piece. It was um, and as you like it for like like 13 squatters, and that's where we developed it. So it makes me. I'm very nostalgic seeing that picture. Um, this, okay, so I'm gonna talk about a project called City Council Meeting, which is a piece that uh, designed by uh, myself, Aaron Landsman, who's a writer, and Jim Finley, who's a designer, um, a piece that the audience performs about civic participation, basically. And so because it's about our interest in why we do or do not actively engage in our, our city council, um, we decided the best way to go about this was that the audience, we should make a piece that the audience can perform. Um, the piece has been made in five cities, um, and there, it's in two parts. And the first part, you come to, this is a courtroom in Houston, a judge in Houston who's, I think her nephew is a choreographer in New York, gave us her courtroom to make the piece in. Um, when you enter, when you come in, there's a video that gives you basically, it's kind of like a jury duty video, and it basically gives you the rules of how to go through the event. And you can participate in a variety of ways, everything from being on the council table to being um, on the one extreme to being a bystander on the other extreme, which means that you're asked to leave and then come in when the meeting starts. And then there's, and there you can be a, you can give testimony or you can be um, a supporter, which means you do a lot of actions in the audience, but you don't have to talk. So there's a variant of ways to participate. Um, so you come in and this portion of the, the meeting is, um, is basically, uh, so this is, this is our council table. Um, and this portion of the meeting is basically uh, transcripts of city council meetings from, I think, six or seven different cities all over the uh, United States. Um, and they, they, the people behind, there's a, a group. So the people sitting at the table, those are people in the audience. And the people behind are what we call staffers or facilitators. And they are. Um, People who help the the council table, who have, don't know anything about the piece other than they just show up, they help them get through the meeting. So they are, look like staffers at any city council meeting, and they help each of each person, each city council meeting has their private staffer basically, and so they help them go through um, this meeting. And so this is that's the um, so when you arrive, you decide what you want to do, and then there you have it. So this is another. So in Houston, we did um, we did the we did in three days we did three different sites. This was a courtroom. This is the the gallery space of diverse works, and we also performed at the El Dorado Ballroom, which is um, in um, uh, Project Row Houses, which is also an amazing urban uh, dramaturgical venue in Houston. Um, and and so this was in the gallery. So this is another this is another council. Same staffers, um, and then basically the the way this works is that um, the the second part of the piece is 
is a distinct piece to every city that we go to. So we work with the community based on it. We usually kind of locate an issue that we think is interesting. Usually in order to make this piece, you have to go to a site visit three or four or five times and talk. And we go to city council meetings and we come up with an idea that we're sort of interested in. And the ending in each city is distinct. So where the, this part is, is rehearsed, those staffers we rehearse with, and if you saw this in different places, you basically would see, um, you, the meeting would seemingly be similar, although very different places um, and different fields. And this ending, so this is a band from a, a Baptist church um, in one of the wards. So the ending, and in Houston, we worked with a city council member who developed this drainage <laughs> law, and he had a battle with the churches. Um, so we brought together the city council member with church choirs who were in opposition. So this is, this is the band playing in the second half. Um, this is New York City. We performed in New York City. We, we performed in three different high schools. This is the high school right across from here, Arts Center, the gymnatorium, as they call it. So you'll <laughs> notice some very similarities in terms of um, the setup and the design. In New York City, we worked with um, high school students on high stakes <laughs> testing. Um, and we reenacted a pep board meeting, which uh, I don't know if you've never heard of that. It's a horror show that was when, when Bloomberg replaced the city council meeting, he replaced it with the pep board. And the pep board was basically like puppets of Bloomberg who would like open it up so that people could come and, and they could give their opinion, but they were always ignored. And they'd be like, oh, that's so interesting. We're still going to do what we want to do. And so they became like very, um, and the parents just after a while, especially in his last year, they would just come to the meetings with bullhorns and they would try to shut every meeting down. That's what happened. And so these are students um, <laughs> reading um, from transcripts from a pet board meeting. So that's New York City. This is uh, Tempe, Arizona, where we performed one night in a 3,000 seat theater um, in uh, ASU Gamage, which, um, and so that's the audience. There's a moment where we asked the audience to all go to the back of the room because there were only three people at the meeting. Um, and so this, we played it on the stage in the back. This is an orientation where the staffers talk to individuals um, and give them the rules of the piece. This, in Tempe, the issue that we dealt with was um, <laughs> We went to a city council meeting where all these people came out to like, it's a desert, and they were like, Please, we, really, we really need to have those ficus trees on Main Street. They're very important to us. They're the brand of downtown Tempe, and we really need these ficus trees. Um, and we were just really uh, intrigued with that because there's also like a, ter a very large homeless youth population that are sit under those ficus trees that no one knows how to deal with. And so in the second half of the piece, we we took this space and we filled it. We closed off that curtained area and we filled it with ficus trees. Um, and then at the very end, we pulled the um, up. We pulled this up. So this is where? Oh, this is San Francisco. Um, at, we performed at um, Z Space. I think that might be. And this uh, this finally is in New Hampshire, and we performed in an old Masonic Hall. Um, in at Z Space, we worked with the issues of gentrification and changing over of the city. And in New Hampshire, we took on an issue between uh, the town, the controversy about building a skate park um, <laughs> in Keene, New Hampshire. And it was a little bit sort of the college issue. And the, we changed the room and had skateboarders in, in this hall. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of issues. So sometimes it's very site specific. Sometimes we're in theaters. And it's really us integrating with um, you know, civ the civic business of a place um, and trying to uh, develop something on the spot. The, um, the facilitators, you asked me to talk about this, the facilitators are always people from that community um, that we go to. And some of them are artists, but often they're just people interested in, in the e civic participation. Um, so, and those people, and some of them performers, but not, not always. And then, um, like we try to, in the second half, we try to work specifically with non-performers, people who actually have a stake in the issue that we're dealing with. So in Houston, we had the council member. Um, in New York, we had high school kids. We also invited, the high school kids actually interviewed um, different people in education. So we had council members, we had teachers, 
Um, in Keene, we also had council members who were in, the, in a band with the skateboarders. Um, and in San Francisco, we, worked, we actually worked with an artist from San Francisco who has a company there, and she created a piece um, with her company and w that we sort of consulted on. Um, so probably, I think, let's get to the conversation. Maybe people have, com have questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you. Mayor. Um, we'll hear from Andrew. And I'm, I'm actually going to have to stand back here because I'm running off of my own computer. Um, so I hope that's OK. Uh, I'll start by concurring that that article was a really wonderful read and really inspiring, partly because my first instinct as I read it was to reflect back over 10 years of Under the Radar and think about the ways that we've presented work, how that aligns with what you're arguing. But then I took a step further back and asked how what's happening at the public right now outside of my department, outside of uh, my control, let's say, like the things that I work on, how that's even reflective of, or, or rather would benefit from a reading through the urban dramaturgy lens. Um, and so uh, I, you know, I, I thought instantly of public works, and I'm going to pull this up. Um, so the public works program, uh, in which uh, uh, it's entering its third year, we partner with uh, s different community organizations around the five boroughs. Uh, through classes, workshops, and then a 200-person production. Uh, last year uh, was Winter's Tale uh, with Sesame Street. And, um, uh, and then also the Mobile Shakespeare Unit, which uh, is sort of reawakening uh, part of the legacy of the public by putting Shakespeare back on the road and going to different um, community centers around the five boroughs. Um, and I keep saying we, which is really unfair, because as I mentioned, I have nothing to do with those programs. Uh, I just admire them. I think they're wonderful. Um, yeah, right. Um, and then also just looking at a few things that are running right now at the public, Hamilton, Toast, and Buzzer. Um, uh, particularly Toast, uh, Lemon invited uh, street artist AV1 to come in and work as one of the production designers um, and to bring the street art into the space. Um, and then Buzzer and Toast both have on the mezzanine level installations. Um, uh, Buzzer, it's, it's a, a project, uh, a large map of the city where people can put pins that indicate how they feel in terms of safety and financial security, or, or um, uh, uh, rather home security uh, in the city at this moment. And so it asks, because this piece is about gentrification, it asks people to think dramaturgically about their relationship uh, to the city. And Toast, uh, there's the, the La Nona project, which uh, you should either go see or, or go on the website and watch, because it's a beautiful animated film that Lemon uh, has brought into the conversation about his work. Um, but I mention all these because these productions and these programs all interrogate how we live in this city, who witnesses, and who's represented. Um, so all of that aside, I'm taken by the fact that in your article you mention, uh, and you said it here as well, that urban moves beyond the spatial and the geographic toward um, a vision of a city that we desire or produce through dramaturgies. And in this sense, Under the Radar became for me, thanks to you, um, a sort of... I want to get this right because it, it was a thought that popped into my head. An interesting experiment in juxtaposing urban desires. Because over the last 11 years, we've had 160 some odd productions um, from around the world. And many of them are born out of a desire to reflect a certain urban reality. And so I'll refer to Gob Squad's Super Night Shot, uh, which they describe as a magical journey through the nighttime streets of a not too distant city Full of unexpected surprises, the public becomes co-stars in a movie that celebrates unplanned meetings with strangers and delights in the randomness of urban existence. And then to reveal the sort of mechanics of the piece, so the audience would come uh, and, and they would wait outside the theater. And one hour prior, four Gob Squad members met on the stage, started their watches, synchronized them, and then set out into the city with four cameras. Uh, and uh, with the task of creating a heroic film mm -hmm. based in the city. Uh, and in our moment, it was around the public, around Astor Place, uh, in the freezing, freezing cold. Um, and so uh, uh, the heroic film engages people that they meet uh, along the way in the city. Here's the, the big kiss that happens at the end, captured by four cameras. Uh, this, this gentleman was so willing, apparently, to kiss this 
rabbit-faced gob squatter. Uh, and then they strip nearly naked, hop into a car, drive back to the public, come running in with their cameras, pour through what at the time was a building under construction, which only added to uh, the, the, the sort of urban presence, we'll say, of the building. And they run in, the audience follows them, gob squad members plug their cameras in, and then they live mix the movie they just made. And so the audience gets to watch a movie that ends with them cheering uh, and welcoming the, the performers into the space. Magnificent. Uh, the second that I'll bring in is The Commentators by Stan's Calf, which we just did this year in Under the Radar, uh, although it wasn't the first time they were with us as a company. Um, and they describe it, uh, I really love this, once stalwarts of the radio whose voices brought major sporting events into the nation's living rooms, the commentators have fallen on hard times. Now commentating on anything and everything, they say it as they see it, all the world as sport. So we invited them to sit on the mezzanine level of the public during one of the highest traffic periods of the Under the Radar Festival, uh, which included a one-on-one -on -one performance with Reggie Watts that brought hundreds of people who didn't get to see the show. Uh, and they just sat there and with speakers and also live stream online, they live commentated on the spill that happened in the lobby or uh, on the, at one point a loadout was happening and there were dollies late at night rushing through the lobby and they called it like it was the most exciting sporting moment they had ever seen. And so I, I encourage you to go to our website because the full four hours, if you're a, a glutton for joy and punishment at once, uh, you can go listen to it. I've listened to it more than once all the way through. Um, and then the last that I'll bring in in this vein is back-to-back -back small metal objects which they say unfolds amid the pedestrian traffic against the backdrop of the city. On raised seating banks with individual sets of headphones, the audience is wired into an intensely personal drama being played out somewhere in the crowd. Uh, and this, uh, these are photos from when we did the show in 2008 at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. Uh, all right, so I guess what I mean to say by bringing these examples in is that by programming these artists in the festival, in these urban spaces alongside, that is to say programmed along with New York urban dramaturgs like Edgar Oliver and 600 High Women, we're inviting these international artists to remap, repurpose, and misuse our urban spaces according to their desires. And I appreciate that in your article, you bring the Delacorte in as an urban space, because I think too often we conflate the institution with the edifice. Um, the public is an institution, definitely, but 425 Lafayette is uh, anything but that. It's, it's an urban space. It's as an urban a space as any. And when Papp and his cohort came down to the Astor Library, uh, which had been used by the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society uh, and then had fallen into disrepair, they transformed a magnif magnificent but underutilized space into these six theaters, uh, ultimately, that you know today. And um, for those people who haven't worked in these rooms, you, you might not realize how idiosyncratic and um, untheatrical, uninstitutional they are. So this is the Luester. I was so happy to find a photo that lined up with that sketch. <laughs> the Luester and the Martinson are halls. They're terrible, unforgiving halls that are just a joy to work in. Uh, and, they, and they look very similar and, and uh, ask the same things of you as they would have when they were library spaces. Uh, and also, I'll just bring up that the Shiva the dimmer room is called the rabbi room because it was the rabbi's room when Hyas was in occupation, when the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society. So still colloquially around the building, we say, oh, go get it in the rabbi room. And even in our drawings, it's called the rabbi room. Um, and so these, these spaces, coupled with the fact that the public owns um, very little capital, uh, some risers, a couple of lights, and some platforms, uh, uh, some soft goods, really everything's rented and purchased uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So every production we do is, is a sort of urban intervention. <laughs> um, but in recent years, my colleagues and I in the Device Theater Initiative have examined the ways that the public as institution shapes, in a dramaturgical sense, the artistic potential of the public as urban space. Often this means negotiating external forces such as the public assembly permit. Um, so in the early years of Under the Radar, we, weren't, we were easing our way into the public, and we got away with a lot. Um, we misused spaces uh, liberally, and what that meant was we would work with the artist to design how the spaces would be um, purposed uh, without regard to, let's say, the law. And, um, and a lot of, that's also how we saved a lot of money, is we'd take three or four productions, and this is still how we work in some sense, uh, is we would save money by creating these bespoke repertory situations um, and where we would design uh, 
a, a, a layout of the room that was respectful of and answered every single need of all the shows, and yet found a way to transition between them with like the pull of a small curtain. <laughs> so it's, there, there were things that really shouldn't have worked out, but it was because we partnered with the artists and, and they were generous. Um, that's getting harder and harder to do because uh, public assembly permits now uh, we're a city building, and after the construction, we're more under scrutiny. Uh, it's thousands of dollars uh, and weeks of preparation uh, unless it's one of the drawings that exists on file with the city. This is where the, the, the prejudice or the, the perspective of the institution comes into play. The drawings that are on file with the city are proscenium thrust round. It's, it's, the, it's the perspective of the institution. And so, um, we have to always negotiate how far financially we are able to go to be able to execute on the true nature of the work. Um, or we can do what we've often done, which is uh, sidestep that by uh, evoking, you, you do not need a public assembly permit or a temporary public assembly permit if you have fewer than 75 people in the room, um, but then you're privileging the, the, the issue of expense over impact. So that's a decision that we also have to make. And that's, a, I, I would say, an artistic, a dramaturgical decision that shapes how the work is created and received. Um, but last year, we celebrated a seemingly small victory that had major impacts on the work we present. This is going to seem really small, but it was huge to us. Our contracts no longer require that companies bring their own liability insurance policy. And this took years. And it was through no one's fault, but it was a big process of getting the institution uh, to, to make this happen, for us all to agree to this. Um, we had realized that the insurance requirement in our contract could potentially shape the way the artists create work, because by making the uh, risk the artist's concern, we had, in a sense, asked them to consider risk as something outside of the work of art and not an integral part of the production we had invited. And so that single line had mischaracterized for so long what our relationship was and our responsibility was to the work. Um, but all these concerns, insurance, public assembly permits, and lots of other things I won't get to, fall under what I would call production dramaturgy. And I'm, I'm personally uh, interested in how we as an institution can become more conscious of the biases and prejudices that are hard-coded into our producing process. Um, large institutions, this is something that I live with every day and, and appreciate deeply, we have the difficult task of negotiating artistic needs and sustainable practices. And as such, there's almost a religious faith in big data. Um, the, the ability to, to divine what a future production will cost based off of what previous productions have costed and to create archetypes that might line up. Um, and, and there was a really wonderful article in Fortune a couple weeks ago by Stacy Higginbotham about a doctor who signed up for a gym membership, went to her locker, punched or her dressing room, punched in the number, and couldn't get in. And when she went to check in, they said, oh, our algorithm determined that because you're a doctor, you must be a man, so we assigned you the male dressing room. And, and this article was about the danger of algorithms, the, the <laughs> belief that they are somehow a, a perfect function, <laughs> instead of, as I would argue, like budgets, like schedules, like contracts, they're designed with a perspective. And so, um, uh, standardized budgets and, and lines do provide us with a reliable metric for future planning and reprojections, but they also put the institution before the work. They institutionalize, they gentrify the spaces that are meant for urban dr dramaturgical incursions. And these are questions that we're actually actively pursuing right now or, or, or asking of ourselves with the support of EMC Arts and a, and a panel that we've pulled together of staff members and artists that we work with. Um, so that's what I have to say. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, if I could just take five minutes at the end, I was asked to, I think, perhaps contextualize the, the really superb discussions we've had tonight in some kind of larger picture. And um, I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the work I've done on Japan. And I'm going to perhaps take us to an historical perspective too and talk about uh, uh, a research project I did on um, space and urban space, in, in fact, the space of Tokyo in, in the 1960s, which uh, was a really important transformative time in Japan. And um, Brad, could we bring up the slide of um, Zero Jigen, please? Um, so I, I looked at a number of different uh, ways in which the space of, of Tokyo was being used by uh, theater companies, performance artists, and protest groups. And uh, the first case study I looked at was a, a, a um, this, this group called Zero Jigen, who were 
at the time known for doing unruly, uncanny performances uh, that would interrupt the flow of everyday life. They would go on the trains, and for no apparent reason, all of the members of the company would just simply have their right hand in the air, or very often they'd be partially naked, or they would lie in front of the pedestrian crossing, and people would have to step over them. And for them, it was very much a, a philosophy of themselves um, becoming much more um, interconnected with the public space. There's a, quite a kind of fantastical narrative, and I had a very funny interview with the founding member of this company who I was interviewing, and he was about 80, and he, said, he kept saying in the interview, oh, well, we took a lot of LSD in those days. <laughs> um, but he would talk about the way in which their idea was that their action would see, uh, would result in some kind of melding, the, the loss of an individual subjectivity and the feeling that their own bodies would melt into the public space. And he, he wrote these fantastic um, poetic texts, surrealist texts that are very poetic about the idea of our naked bodies would run into the city and the city would look back at us and swallow us up and transform us and take us over. And we would become the city. And so I think this is a very interesting idea uh, in, to think about in relation to the dramaturgy of public space because it's a lot of what we've talked about is this question of... Um, where the performance lies in relation to the space and the kind of collapsing of certain kind of barriers or borders. And here's an example of a company that was really imagining as an artistic practice the idea that they themselves would kind of lose themselves and become a part of the city in, a, in an almost, we might even think about that as a kind of cybernetic way of thinking in the 21st century. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. I did also did a lot of work on the actual protesters in Japan in the 1960s, and this is a movement that was very prominent in many, many places, and there's, I think, a very strong connection between public space performance and the occupation of space by uh, student protesters and workers and uh, people of colour and people from many different minority backgrounds who actively occupied and took over public space. And some of the language we use in relation to the question of tactics or um, 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 uh, occupation zones and these kind of things actually come very much from this idea in the 1960s of putting massive amounts of bodies in a public space and making that space very theatricalized and creating a certain kind of performative reality around that space with the view that through that performance you can transform space. And I did a lot of work on these uh, occupations, these massive occupations that some of the uh, protesters would do, both in the university campuses, but also in major railway stations, for example. And um, it, it's really interesting to see the way in which there's, there's not only a, a, a politics around this, but there's also a, a very evolved poetics around the occupation of public space that evolve at this time. And then another project I did Throughout this book, I was thinking, how am I going to deal with the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games? It's a signature moment in the reconstruction of Japan after World War II, and it's become a, a, a point of nostalgia that I didn't want to buy into in the book. You know, oh, life was so wonderful in the 1964 Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I was very lucky that I came across a, a performance group called Port B, uh, who stage performances in public space in Japan. And they did a performance called Tour Performance Tokyo Olympics. And in uh, 2011, this performance was staged. We got on a bus, a tour bus, uh, which uh, had at the front of it a, an old woman who was actually a professional tour guide from 1964 uh, and had actually run the tours for uh, massive amounts of people who came to Tokyo for the Olympics. And the, the tour was advertised as a tour of all the sites of the Tokyo Olympic Games, all of the buildings that still exist, this wonderful architecture, some of the spatial rearrangements of the city. And in fact, we spent all our time going around these sites. We never actually saw any of them. We were told about them, but there was this very strategic um, elision of the actual event itself because this was a performance that didn't want to celebrate um, in an uncritical way this very nostalgic moment in the past. And so we spent a lot of time, in a sense, 
putting these events in their history, in their place, and we heard stories about how they were built or what was there before the building was built or why we couldn't go there because in one instance uh, we couldn't go there uh, because there was a, 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 a big public event on and the road was blocked. And eventually, this is a five and a half hour performance, eventually we ended up on one of those endless Tokyo motorways right out in Tokyo Bay in the middle of nowhere in a, in a very modern motorway with all the cars running by and we're in this tiny little island in the middle of the, the, the two sides of the, of, of the motorway um, where there were like two drink machines and a toilet. And it's five and a half hours, we're out there, the wind's blowing like crazy. And I said to the director, why are we here? And um, he said, well, if you look over there, and we looked over in the distance and he said, well, that's where the 1936 Olympic Games were supposed to be. Um, but the 1936 Olympics were, of course, cancelled because of the war. Um, and so I thought that was a very interesting point to perhaps end on in relation to these performances because that was a public, a, an urban dramaturgy about a memory of an event that never existed. Uh, but it, in drawing attention to that non-existence, we also were drawing attention to the, the reason why, and that became incredibly significant. And I think so. there's something about that way in which that example and the other examples that we've had, the many, many examples, um, uh, speak to a certain kind of um, relational aesthetics to space, if you like, or a certain kind of uh, encounter with space, which is always somehow asking us to think about our relationship to that space and how we're drawn into this encounter, which is, I think, deeply immersive, often very fun and hilarious, uh, but also very, very political. And, uh, and I, th I think that's probably uh, a good way to try and do a very uh, un uncoherent summary of the <laughs> great performances that we've had. I just want to bring something I'm thinking a lot about, because uh, in, in doing city council meeting, we kind of went back to kind of Plato's ideas about democracy. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and Aaron Landsman, who is the writer, his father was a, a, law, a, a law teacher. Um, and so Aaron grew up with a lot of Plato, and I didn't. So I had to go back, and I was like in, in the dialogues and everything. And, and I mean, it was like in the last year, I think, or so, I went back to look at them, because we're trying to write a book maybe about it. Um, and I realized that um, a lot of what was influencing our process was Irving Goffman's work about the performance of the self in everyday life. And, and it, we're very interested in that, just like how people perform themselves. And a lot of city council meeting was kind of about that, you know, what like the kind of performance we were interested in was about that. But I, in going back to the Plato, I realized in the dialogues that his whole, like Plato gave us this problem with the active and the passive, right? The problem of, of the theater, you know, and versus choreography, which was more active. And theater was passive in the sense of the audience watched and, but I, what I realized in reading it is that he developed all this, the problem of mimesis, of trust. We, ha, we shouldn't train people to fool other people, you know, to be. But all of it hinges on the idea. It's all because he, he was theorizing about cities. He was, he was theorizing about populations being. The polis. To, to, in polises. So, so what I think is so fascinating, I mean, in, in a way, we're still grappling with this thing. And, and most of these kind of projects are still grappling with the passive versus the active, the idea of mimesis, the danger of mimesis, right? That, that if you, people lived in three people in a farm in the rural area, it didn't matter, you know what I mean? Like, they were just themselves. They didn't go to this place and perform this duty. And it wasn't dangerous that this, you might be really good at fooling people, which is what Plato was really, you know, on about and so I was just I kind of had this like total epiphany because I'm like oh my god this is this is what he was talking about and it's like this thing that still is fueling all this work which is like the part the idea of participation or I mean we were very influenced by Rossier's work called the emancipated spectator um, which is amazing you know how he kind of breaks down this thing and Rossier I mean I guess I kind of came back to Plato through Rossier who is a who has a wonderful reading of, of what Plato's doing and the theatricality. But I just, I, I was sort of taken going back to that, which is that it was all driven by his concern about when large populations lived together, the danger 
that <laughs> the theater would, would be, mm. you know? And, and when we look at all this work, it really, I mean, he was really on to something. He really, like, he came down on one side, you know what I mean, or the other, but he really kind of understood, like, what was going to be at the heart of all this stuff, and I think we're still grappling, you know, with these ideas um, that, that, you know, are kind of, that he kind of pointed out so long ago, you know, at the inception of sort of Western theater. Yeah, well, this conversation has <clears throat> clarified for me a moment of danger I experienced when I saw city council meeting at LaGuardia. Mm. When a, a, a fairly well-to-do professor got up and assumed <gasps> the role of a, a young black woman and sort of played at the role and and my response at the time was, oh, this is, this is wrong or unsafe or whatever <laughs> because of subjectivities. But now I'm thinking how much more interesting it is and, and appropriate perhaps to think about the fact that I was watching two different understandings of this urban uh, reality uh, coexisting. Two New Yorks both taking place and occupying the same space and occupying the same body and how that dissonance wasn't necessarily that professor's fault. It was, he was embodying a whole mess of, sorry, of New York's right on the stage. And that, so anyway, that just gave me a new appreciation for what happened there. Yeah, I mean, what happened in, in Air, Tempe, Arizona was incredible. Like we were so, we had one African-American staffer <clears throat> and we had like homeless youth on the, on the city council meeting and the, they were just, there's a section in city council meeting that's based on these kids in San Antonio who came as part of an, af, uh, was like a summer work program. They were always, at, they were asked to kind of write a two minute testimony and come to the city council meeting and present. And 50 of them got very well dressed. They stood up and in city council meetings, you can't applaud, but you stand in, um, in support, right? So these kids, very formal. And there's transcripts of, in, our, in, in, in the production, there's transcripts of this. Well, in Arizona, the, the audience just was like hooting and hollering. And it was <laughs> like, I mean, we were just like, I, I mean, we were just, just shocked. Yeah. I mean, we were shocked. And one of our staffers, she, you just see her just boiling over like and um you know arizona is very difficult if you happen to be Afri african american and we were just kind of like like you know and that happens in subtle ways but there it was like it was crazy hmm. it was really crazy and um and kind of shocking but but i was thinking to myself like oh this is kind of great because the ending that we did was very very sober um, and very, very serious. And I knew, boy, we were gonna, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we're gonna get you. Was, yeah, yeah, because they, they had just like put themselves out there on the platter. And then when they went into that second part, it was very quiet. It was very serious because it was about their city and, and their business lady and a mm. homeless woman that we worked for, for over a year. You know, and it was very, but but that's again. I mean, that's that's the for us when we do it, we purposely don't. We just hand out these testimonies, right? And we make no attempt to cast anything. And so you get an old woman playing a young person, you get a white person playing a black person, you get you know you get all those things, and you get to really watch how somebody negotiates that very sticky wicket. You know what I mean? It's a very, and for us, often it's really beautiful because you get this sense of like, like people really grapple with that problem. You know, like how do I speak for somebody else? And a lot of times it's very respectful and beautiful. Mm. You know, it's, it's a really gorgeous moment, but that sometimes they just cross right over it into like, being that person that they think <laughs> those kind of people are. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, and it makes people uncomfortable, but that's sort of the point of the piece is to look at that moment, right? Um, and we, we, you know, we always say, like our staffers always say, just remember that you're, you know, you're speaking, you're saying words that someone actually said in a city council meeting mm -hmm. in the last three years. And you will, your, your job is to speak for someone else here, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, a fa it's fascinating, but that's that sort of platonic, mm -hmm. you know, like, <laughs> like that moment. Yeah. We've got about 10 minutes left, so I might just open it up to the floor if uh, there are questions. And we're going to uh, have a mic roving around because we are st uh, streaming this. So 
if you've got a question, please put your hand and we can um, to the microphone. Uh, thank you for um, all of this. This is very uh, enlightening. Um, and in particular, what I thought about, um, Andrew, with your talking about um, the work you're doing at the public, the word scalability came up, kept coming up for me. Um, and how, because when you're in institutions or, or organizations, there's always it's coming from somewhere, This, if something is successful, okay, let's do more of it and bigger and, you know, <laughs> and then how, and how does that impact, and, and possibly all of you can respond to that, but it's, it's this kind of buzzword that goes around when something works, right? Yeah, it's a very interesting question, I think, in relation to space, to public space, because not all public space is available on a mega scale, so, yeah. Has anybody got any responses to that? I mean, the urban is a buzzword, and it's always being marketed. Um, that's why I'm very um, careful, because it's just not just because you're doing something in the city that it's, you know, dangerous or whatever. But on the on the counter, yeah, I think that um, one of the reasons I was so excited that Andrew was here is because how 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 are institutions embracing? this radicality or whatever you want to call it, um, of artists who are working in these ways and thinking about context, that's why I brought context into the conversation, into the content or dramaturgy of, of the piece. And um, so, so, so that it's not like a selling point. Um, I'm sure you can talk about uh, this more. I'll, I'll talk about it a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So for me, um, my work does not scale well at all, right? So like, those you could have 18 people on the boat. Um, that's 18 people a night, and the show was basically done with friends and volunteers. The tickets were pretty affordable, all things said and done. Um, and we sold all of our tickets in an hour. So you know that's that's a problem immediately in terms of scalability. So and this is a problem that that I that I always have, and and my friends always have. Sarah's work, uh, Snow Migration. You could have 40 people, and it was based on how many buses, you know, how many vans could take people. So it always has problems. And um, for me, I, there are two things. One is that I think about scalability um, in terms of audiences, and I think about a primary audience, which is that, that sort of ticket buying audience that's there. Then I think uh, about a secondary audience, which is that audience that might be passing by, and how can I write to or how can I address them um, I did a play on the New York City subway, and I wrote it as a melodrama so that anybody who came upon the piece uh, could figure out that the guy with the mustache was the bad guy, you know? <laughs> so so I, I wrote for that. And then, then the third is the, is the tertiary audience and, and, or, you know, the media audience or the sort of myth or the, the long-term audience. For me, I never saw Father was a Peculiar Man. I never saw Reza's works uh, in real life. I never saw... The TP, but all of these are so real to me. All of these are real stories, and 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 for me, that's the that sort of ongoing conversation as an artist. It's I can't answer for an institution. It makes no sense for an institution, but it sure as hell makes sense for an artist. Well, and we we have an issue. Um, we're we're speaking to yet another audience that we don't in this industry usually like to say out loud, which is the the market. And that under the radar coincides with the arts presenters conference, and and it, we're not in service of that. But much of why the festival scene has come up is because of the fact that we have had this, these thousands of people descend upon New York every year, and we we have the opportunity to acculturate them and to and to introduce them to more exciting, challenging work. Um, and there are those who are really excited to join us on that journey. But we have a responsibility um, to, to not, thankfully our budget is so low that we, we rarely have the inclination to go, let's put them in a bigger space and make more money, because we won't. Um, but we still have to think deeply about how we show the work, because it's not just about how it's received by that audience, but it's all the potential audiences that may come in the future, and all of the presenters who will conceive of their ability and their willingness to present this work based off of how we show it as a product. 
which is a really dirty word. But it's, so, so particularly the shows that take place in outside of traditional theaters or that convert traditional theaters into a site for urban uh, dramaturgy, ur urban conversation, urban investigation, those shows we have to be really uh, careful with. That's all I'll say. It's a question here, I think, so. Yeah, well, it was just uh, to go on what, what Jeff was saying, because what you said really hit me was uh, the fact that you have these layers of audience and uh, the final one being kind of the media that is really the, the most, I think that's the most difficult one to deal with. Because when I was talking with you too, Bertie, about the, the idea of what gets documented and how it gets documented, and then as an artist, how do you fit within that? And when you say the word legend or something like that, I think it's a, a lot of times it's, it's, it's necessary to stay anonymous so that it doesn't get captured and defined. So that the, the audience then is something that is not fixed, it keeps going. Um, I know, uh, and then also speaking to this, where, where is it? So a lot of times what you have to do is work that doesn't have a ticket price, that doesn't have uh, or a, a very expensive ticket price. I know from your list a lot of times people are just going to a spot, a secret spot, finding it. And they become almost the audience that is the, um, the witnesses. They know something inside on it. And then there's this other audience. And it just keeps ranging out like that. And I think that's, the, uh, from what I've heard everybody say here, that to me is the most interesting part of it, is the fact that uh, this audience that you're uh, looking for as an artist in this urban dramaturgy is something that, that is, uh, has aspects of public in it, but also uh, of the public audience, but also has aspects of, of uh, a witnessing audience, somebody who's initiated to knowing what's going on. And they're there to watch and tell the story beyond just uh, what everybody else sees. And I like the interaction between the two. Um, uh, the, Bouteau, a lot of times we're working in Bouteau right now, a lot of times, people don't understand what the process of the, of the Bouteau dancer is. Mm -hmm. and, but those initiating Bouteau know what it is. And so a lot of times when uh, we, we, the masters will come here to, to uh, New York and perform, oh. they'll perform in a public audience, but with a witnessing initiated audience who have seen the work closely to know what the process is that the dancer is doing. And that dich dichotomy or between this public audience and then, you know, this initiated audience and then these naked, half-naked performers performing and the, the, the tension between the two is, to me, the most interesting part of this urban dramaturgy is the conflicting audiences coming together, right? Yes. Uh, it was a, that wasn't a question, I guess. <laughs> it was a question. <laughs> Great we've, we've probably got time for one more question or comment if there's something from the floor. Um, Good. Well, we, we can take two if it's quick. So. Mm -hmm. Curious if either one of you guys want to respond to this. Um, sometimes when I see work like this presented, um, especially work that's like in an unexpected place, it feels like um, some kind of amazing fait accompli that's like always been there. And I'm so curious to think about like if you could reveal some choices that you made like in the process of, of putting some of your work together, um, like draft versions or failed versions or things that uh, changed or, or um, how you got to the final points in like either of the projects that, that think through, that might help us think through like what are the kind of choices you're making if you're stepping outside of what the typical theater might maker might understand as like what makes vi a viable performance um, in a standard institutional context. So, so do you mean like how might one arrive at place or or people or both or? Uh, I suppose. Um, well, like in your work, I'm thinking of. Um, uh, there's probably more and less uh, exciting um, renderings of that uh, that you saw over time. And how did you maybe change your structure or think about uh, distribution of texts? Yeah, well, um, for in, in what like what was your litmus test for like, oh, baby, this is working versus like, 
yeah, Ugh, but, that didn't you know, work so well. Yeah, I mean, a really early, set, like we used to do the city the council table and give like all the council members like the script, like the whole script, and it was kind of like <laughs> they were just people would just like read ahead, like they wouldn't listen to each other, right? Because they're so nervous that they're just like reading ahead. So like, was no. There was nothing, like they wouldn't listen to people. And so we were like, okay, how do we take the script away from them? And that's how we developed, like each person had a staffer. Because they literally would just get like a card or like only the mayor had a script and we had the secretary. So we took all that away. And the minute we took it away, it was kind of like, okay, what's going on? I don't know. I just got to wait. And then, and then after that, we realized we could evolve their experience. So we made it more and more intricate what the staffer did. In the beginning, it's like North Dakota, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, they just vote yes. You know what I mean? Like, so they were just sitting there. But then by Houston, the staffers were like, okay, this guy is doing this, and you're doing this, and you think this, and that guy over there. And they're feeding him all this information, and we really were able to kind of change the performances of the council members. Mm -hmm. like, so that's like, I mean, that's an example. I, I went to an early version, I think when, uh, I think before you came, when Aaron was testing stuff out. Oh, yeah. And um, it, some parts didn't work at all. Oh, was that Prelude? <laughs> it may be. No, yeah. it was like some private thing. Was the it, here, and the here, you know, here Art Center has like a place where they rehearsed before. Oh, yeah, I don't know, maybe. Some I mean, really I think version, in the beginning but, we thought, oh, maybe people should just get up and like say whatever they want to say. And then it was really boring. And yeah, it was really. And then really Aaron, boring. Aaron was really smart. You know, I mean, he, what he said was like, and this is what we developed over a long period of time. Talking about it, he was like, "This is we're not making something so that you can feel good that you participated, and and we're making some like." If you have something to say that's something important, go to your city council. Go there. That's not what this is about. It's not standing in for you doing that. <laughs> it, that's not what this is about. What this is about is. is like how do you encounter putting yourself in that position with somebody? And so these are, you know, and it's because because we would encounter this all the time. Like, well, why I just want to say what I want to say, and we're like, well, it's not that interesting actually. You know, it's way more interesting for you to like really grapple with why you're here your judgment of everybody else in the room, which is why a lot of people don't go to city council meetings, because it's boring, and you just sit there and you judge everybody. You're like, that woman's a crazy person, and that, that you do. And that's, <laughs> that's why it's uncomfortable, is because you understand how judgmental you are about other people, and what you think is interesting and what you don't. And so that's how, you know, through evolution, we, you know, but it, it was a lot of iterations. Sort of. It's not something you started with, but supposition was like, let's just stage a city council meeting as if it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's that thing of like you have an instinct or an urge to do something and you, you're, you're passionate about it because you think there's something to it, but you don't know, like until you start doing it, you can't possibly know what the steps are going to get there. And you don't even know really what's at the heart of your own idea, right? Because <laughs> we found out what the heart of our own idea was really like this platonic thing of like the qualification of no qualification. That democracy actually is the best system we've come up with. But what it really means is it's a qualification of no qualification. And that is the best way to have government, is that everybody, everybody could do it. <laughs> and that's a serious thing. And we don't think about that. We don't think about that. We think about like you got to have money, you got to have it. But really the heart of all the other systems is that nobody is qualified, and that's why you're qualified. So there's nobody in this room or any room that you go to that couldn't be the president, that doesn't have a right to do that. And, and so when we realized that, we realized, oh, the whole performance has to convince people who feel unqualified that they're qualified. Mm -hmm. So we can't have actors being the staffers who are like, I'm in the character. I think this is a really interesting issue because I think recently there's been a spate of performances like the examples you've given, but also um, the Enemy of the People by the Shalbuna, where people go in order to participate in some kind of democratic, um, uh, have some, some intense democratic experience. If you go and see that play, they're all yelling and saying, but, you know, this is, this is a really important issue. Um, and it's out of this, you know, I think profound sense of frustration with the kind of blockage in the political systems that do exist. But um, um, anyway, we, we thank you for very much for that, those comments and thank you for that very good question. Unfortunately, we've completely out of time now, but I do invite you to stay back and 
follow the conversation further with the, with the guests here tonight. So if I could just thank, first of all, Bertie for not only speaking tonight, but organising. And Jeff, Mallory and Andrew, thank you so much for your yes. presentations. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming tonight. So.